If you want to stand out from the crowd of programmers, one of the best things you can do is to differentiate yourself by writing high quality code. Now, hopefully we all at this point understand the value in things like functions should only have one purpose, using um, very simple names for variables that correspond to what they are, uh, adhering to a naming structure for functions, you know, either underscore or camel case, things like that. Hopefully all of that goes without saying. But Python, since version 3.5, has another feature that allows us to write even cleaner code that is much easier for human beings to read and understand what you have going on. I'm, of course, speaking about type hinting. Now, type hinting lets the user know when they're reading the code uh, what exactly each particular variable is in terms of its type. So what type each variable is and what the function should return, which is of course not always clear from reading the code in Python. Now all of this is necessary because Python is a dynamically typed language where you can have a variable change its type within a function. It could be passed in as a parameter and be an integer and come back as a float. All of this is possible within Python because it's not a strongly typed language. And so we have to have workarounds uh, to allow the readers, the new programmers, to understand exactly what each particular variable is. So to see how that works, let's start with the code we worked with last time for the video on uh, creating classes with the type keyword to write dynamic classes. So if you went poking around in that code, you might have found this utils.py file. And in it, I have a very simple function that converts an array. It's really a list. It would be a better naming scheme if I want to write better code. I never claim to be free from sin. I'm no saint myself. But it takes a list of arrays and converts it to a list of tensors. Now, it's not immediately clear what looking at this function, what exactly array is and what precisely device is. So we can provide type hinting for anyone reading this code in a very simple way. So we need a new import. We want to say from typing import list, that'll allow us to use list as a type hint. Then we come down to the function and we use a very simple syntax. And we just say colon of type list. And then device, what is device? Well, if you do programming with PyTorch, you know that device is a string. And then we can indicate uh, what this function returns by putting an, uh, a dash and a greater than sign and say type list. So it takes a list and a string as input and returns a list. So whoever reads the function knows straight away what these inputs are and what to expect as an output from the function. Now that is pretty simple, so we can right quit out of there and take a look at uh, another file where things are going to get a little bit more hairy. So let's take a look at the agent.py file. And before I proceed, of course, I'm going to leave a link to this gist in the description, so check out the code there. You can just do a get clone of that so that you actually have the code available for you to do this. Uh, so let's start from the beginning. We want to say from typing import list optional and, and tuple. Uh, so we've already seen list. Optional is what we use when we have a variable for which we have default values because that means it's optional. We don't have to supply it in the constructor or the function call because we have a default value. And a tuple is precisely what you would expect. But we also have, um, we have stuff that is related to functions we have written, classes we have written. So in particular, this queue online and queue target is something that we wrote. That's not something built in from Python. So what we have to do is say um, from uh, networks import linear network. So we can use our class definition, our class name as a type hint. And then we also have a memory and a policy down there. So we're going to need from generic import replay buffer. Now replay buffer if you recall the previous video, if you haven't seen it, don't worry, I'm going to show you here in a minute. But replay buffer wasn't the name of the class within the file. So if we do an import there, we're actually going to have a bit of an issue. And we're going to fix that in a minute. It's not such a big deal, but just be aware that if you try to run the code at this point, it's going to bark at you. And then from policy import epsilon greedy policy. And then uh, I believe that is it for our typing. So what we need to do then is add our type hints. So Q inline is a linear network, and we can clean this up by putting stuff on a uh, new line just so that it isn't all crowded. And then Q target is also a linear network. And then the memory is 
a replay buffer and our policy is an epsilon greedy policy. You can hear my kids drop something upstairs. And then we have our variables for which we have supplied default values. So here we say it is optional and it is of type float and the default value is 0 0.99. The learning rate is also optional of type float with the default value of one by 10 to the minus four. And um, the replace parameter is also optional, but that is of type integer and that gets a default value of 1000. And that handles the uh, type hinting for our constructor. And then we have uh, other functions that we can handle as well to make things a little bit more clear for our readers. So here we have our update network parameters function and we take two inputs. Now these are what? So you know that from the name that we're going to be updating network parameters. But if you've just stumbled upon this code, what is a network? So it turns out obviously that a network is the same thing as the Q online and Q target networks. So these are both linear networks. Destination is the same. And what do we have for a return value? In this case, it returns nothing. So a return type of none. Now I'm kind of on the fence about having the return type of none. I can see that, you know, there, that may be the le least valuable thing of all, but I've included it for um, just for the sake of completeness. Next, we have a function to store our transition. So these star args could be anything, really. Star args is a convention in Python that means that you have any amount of um, positional keywords, and so, or excuse me, positional parameters. So uh, this will be of type um, list, and this function will return none. No oh, good grief. <laughs> what a disaster. Okay, so it'll return none. Then next, of course, we have our sample memory function, and that doesn't take any inputs, but it does return a tuple of type torch.tensor. So it's gonna return a tuple of torch tensors. Reason being is we have this function here, convert arrays to tensors. That's going to take our list of uh, memory arrays and convert them to a tensor, um, a list of tensors, excuse me. Then we have our function to choose our observation. So I'm checking to see if you can still see. So in our observation, we have of type numpy array, and that returns numpy int 64. So it's gonna return a 64-bit integer from our policy. And then our replace target network function returns nothing and takes no inputs. So we can do that. And then we have our update function that also takes no inputs and uh, returns nothing. So already we have much cleaner, much more professional looking code and it only took a few minutes. What are we in? Nine minutes of recording. It'll obviously be shorter when I upload it, but uh, we have very, very little effort on our part and we've created much more, I don't know, I guess more readable code for other people and it makes you look better, frankly. So let's right quit out of that. Uh, then we also have our Epsilon Greedy policy file. Oh, you know what? Let's, let's actually do, sorry. Let's go to the... Uh, generic.py file so we can handle making our replay buffer type. So we again want to change our imports. We want to say from typing import list new type and a tuple. And then of course we still need numpy. So let's just start from the top. So max size is an integer, batch size is an integer, and fields is a list of strings. Very, very simple. Our store transition function items is a list and we return uh, nothing. Then our sample buffer function doesn't take any input, but it does return a list. Our uh, ready function returns a type bool. Uh, and then we can come down to our initialized memory function and deal with that. So uh, one thing I wanna do is introduce a new type. What I want to say is, I want to say replay buffer equals new type. Uh, string representation is replay buffer. It's how we're going to refer to it in the code. And it's um, an alias for a type generic buffer. Now we need this uh, for use in our agent class for handling the type hinting of the, um, of the memory. 
and it'll tell us that it's a, a type replay buffer. And this is kind of a kludgy solution um, because I've set it up as an alias for a generic buffer. It's kind of true because the replay buffer down here does derive from the generic buffer. So it's one of those kind of sort of true things. Uh, but it's the best I could come up with for this particular instance where we're defining classes in terms of a type because this takes place outside of the global scope. And so I'm not sure otherwise how to handle that. I'm sure in the future I'll have a better solution, but for now that's what I came up with. And then we can come in here to our function definition and this will be of type tuple. Memory size is an integer, of course. And our batch size is also an integer. And this returns type replay buffer. That's why we have to define this above. And then I believe that is it for our memory class. Let's write quit. And then we can take a look at our epsilon greedy policy. So once again, we need our typing imports. We're gonna say from typing import optional because everything else is a uh, pretty simple built-in data type. So number of actions is going to be an integer. Epsilon start is of course optional of type float, the default value of 1.0. Epsilon decrement, optional float, one by 10 to the minus five. And epsilon min, optional float, Oops, default of 0 0.01. And then our decrement epsilon function doesn't take any inputs, returns none. Our call takes Q values. Um, so the Q values are a torch.tensor, I believe, and then the um, return type is numpy array. So let's take a look. Yes, t.argmax of Q values, numpy random choice action space. Yes, okay, so that is correct so that is our policy and then what is left we have our networks we can handle that next so then we have from typing import list optional and tuple and I have a whole bunch of stuff for importing input dims as a type tuple um, let's do this actually and actions is an integer. Hidden dims is optional. Type list, default value of 256 by 256. Our feed forward function takes a torch tensor as input and also returns a torch tensor. Okay, then we can take a look at our main file and then uh, we'll be done. We'll just execute it one time to make sure that I didn't make any typos and we'll be good to go. So one thing I see that I did is I changed the import. Uh, do I need to do that really? Hmm. I don't think so. So uh, do we need any type hinting in here? We don't have any definitions, do we? We do have this main function and I suppose if you really want to be complete completionist and pedantic you can just specify that it takes a return type of number it does that. it has no parameters and so we don't have to specify anything there and so I think that is it oh you know what in my agent I did say from policy okay so let's move epsilon greedy policy dot pi to policy and then come down here and say from policy I knew I was forgetting something okay now let's try running it and make sure I didn't make any silly typos. Nope, it runs straight away. That's a new moon record. Okay, so what have we done? What we have done here is we have taken some code that was sort of well written. I use descriptive variable names. Uh, each function handles one thing for the most part. And I've kind of elevated it a level by making it more clear to you, the reader, what everything is within that code. Now this works in conjunction with um, good comments where you explain the context of how things work and why they work. Uh, but this is really a key to writing good code. And I've seen this all over the Acme library. That's really what started me down this path. Now, of course, I have to practice what I preach. So one of my projects for the next month is to totally revamp my GitHub 
there are some open issues there that have to be closed, as well as I have to write readmes, I have to rethink the file structure. There's a whole slew of work to be done on my GitHub, not only to incorporate type hinting to make the code more readable, but to just kind of overall improve it to make it not such a rat's nest, as it were. Okay, so I hope that was helpful for you. If it was, make sure to leave a comment. It really does help. My stuff isn't very visible from the algorithm. This is a very niche topic. So if you liked it, please leave a comment to that effect down below. Leave a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe if you want more content like this. And I'll see you in the next video.